Hi, welcome back to Kingdom in Context. I'm Sean Griffin, and tonight we have a special broadcast. We're going to be discussing biblical finance. I'm joined with a good brother and friend, Bren Fox. Hi, Bren. Welcome to Kingdom in Context. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, man. I'm glad to have you on. I think this is important information that uh, many believers in the body struggle with and can really benefit from just learning how to handle your finances according to biblical principles. And so I think you've prepared... Um, quite a bit of information about this, right? Yes. Um, we've got a few uh, bits of information that we're going to go over this evening. And yeah, it really is a very important topic. And it's something that um, we really struggle with, especially in this culture when it's not necessary. And the beauty of it is there's so much instruction, just like there is for every other area of life on personal finance, even in our modern day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's um, I actually, many people may not know this, but for several years, I actually was a financial planner slash investment planner. I worked with uh, school teachers and helped them with their personal state retirements and personal investments. And it was um, uh, quite an experience just to see, to sit down with someone, even if it was a short five minutes, and just to see how little information they had um, or had ever been shared with them concerning financial topics, financial concepts, strategies, principles. And, you know, what's sad is sometimes Brennan and I would be talking to folks that had absolutely no money to deal with. So therefore they didn't even want to learn about investment concepts. So in the course yeah. of the years that I was doing this, I would actually run into people that initially in the first few years that I was doing this, I would go back to the same schools and deal with the same school teachers over time. And I would run into people that in the first year said, well, I don't make enough money. So, you know, I can't invest anything for retirement. And then three years later, they got a settlement for an insurance case. <laughs> And by the time I talked to them, I was like, oh, that's awesome. So I can show you how to invest that and help supplement your retirement and, you know, provide a nice nest egg for you once that time comes. But yet they'd already spent that invest that insurance settlement um, because they didn't have a plan. Right. And they didn't yeah. understand the principles of what to do when you got the money in your hands at some point in your life. So to the viewer out there watching this, I know that many times um, information we receive at this moment in our life may not be 100% applicable, but yet five years from now, it may save you an incredible amount of heartache in your, in your life. Or it could provide the proper prudence for a proper retirement. You know, so um, I'm excited to, to jump into this topic. Yeah, and you know, I think, I think you said it so well. Um, almost everyone that I work with, and I say this all the time, almost everyone that I work with doesn't typically have an income issue it's exactly what you said. When they get the money, whether it's a little bit or a lot, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know the principles to follow. And that's where I come in. That's where applying the scriptures to our modern day uh, culture comes in. And the thing is, is we can figure out how to retire even with a small income. And it's not only about retirement, right? It's about getting off the grid, detaching from the system and being self-sustainable and just all these other things that come with needing to have more money, more blessings, and be able to manage them properly. And at the end of the day, we are stewards of the blessings that the Father gives us. So it's up to us to properly manage those blessings. And again, whether it's a little bit or a lot, we have to know how to do that. And thankfully, all of the, the know-how is right there in the Scripture. It really is. The Scripture is just a wealth of, a wealth of wisdom. It absolutely oh, yeah. is. So I guess the big question a lot of folks initially have, Brennan, is, you know, is borrowing wrong? It is. It, it definitely is. Everywhere we look in the scripture, there is, I don't think that there's ever something positive about borrowing. Um, especially when we're looking through the, the back end, the tail end of the Torah, and then through Proverbs. Borrowing is constantly a negative. So one of the first things we see in the scriptures is Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 3. It says, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. And this is this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it from his neighbor or his brother because it is called Yahuwah's release. Of a foreigner, you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother. So we have this, we have this question, right? And on a broad scale, yes, borrowing is wrong. On a smaller scale, we can say, well, maybe not because what we just read kind of makes it seem like it is okay to borrow. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this year of release, right? So that's one of the main objectives I get when I say, yes, borrowing is wrong. Now, the key here, something to keep in mind is we're going to see later in Deuteronomy that the only 
the only circumstance we can borrow in is from our fellow believer, which is a brother or sister, right? And the reason is they have specific guidelines to follow as well. Like they can't charge interest, like what we just read, right? You can't, you can't exact something if you've lent to your brother. But the problem is we borrow in this country from all different kinds of corporations and people who are of the nations who don't follow those biblical guidelines. And that's where we get in so much trouble. And that's where I would say, yes, it's definitely wrong. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So if you're just, um, basically it's like a safety net for the, the person that you're borrowing from, if it's a fellow believer, they're obligated to abide by the same standards, by the same rules. Absolutely. So whether you're a lender or a borrower, you're, you're not disadvantaged. That's right. And so we can get into that and we can see who can, who can and can't we borrow from and who can we even lend to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Deuteronomy 15.6, it says, For who are your Elohim blesses you as he promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And you shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. So we're able to lend to these nations, but we're not supposed to borrow to them. And this is a provision to protect us, right? Because the trap that, that comes with borrowing from people, from corporations, etc. I mean, it's, it's modern day slavery, you yeah. know? Um, and Proverbs illustrates that very clearly. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, 19, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent. You cannot charge interest on that. But see, that's to your brother. Um, just before, we saw that we can lend to the nations. And then later, we're going to see we can actually charge interest to the nations as well. Deuteronomy 28, 12. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So it's interesting how that works because, I mean, obviously, if you're a lender, it's your discretion whether you're going to charge interest or not. But the allowance is there by the Torah if someone is just, you know, let's say an atheist who could care less about the scriptures and, and the God of the Hebrew Bible and all these things. Well, if you're going to lend to that person, it's okay to charge interest. Not that you have to, but it's okay. However, you should not be borrowing from them. And if you ever lend to your brother in the faith, do not charge them interest by any means. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, it, isn't it amazing just how much this stuff is just tucked away into the Torah and yeah. God's instructions for living. It's and incredible. Yeah, it is. It, the whole purpose of it, of course, was to create peace, mm -hmm. the interaction between people. Um, and so obviously once these rules are not applied and, and people don't abide by these instructions, you start getting, like you said, whether it's um, an obligated servanthood or even in worst cases, what, what feels like slavery. Right? Absolutely. This idea of like you are a slave to the to the lender because you can't repay him everything that's owed, uh, depending on what's going on. And of course, the beautiful caveat in all this is that year of release, which is wonderful, right? Because what right. happens? Bats broke your leg, circumstances came up, you couldn't pay it off, but right. you know you still have this jubilee. Right, and again, that's with your fellow brother in the faith, right? Because. Um, a lot of people try to equate that to bankruptcy and say, oh, well, there, you know, there's still a, a year of release in, in, uh, in our culture today. And bankruptcy, you know, that lasts for seven years, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people misunderstand bankruptcy. Um, I mean, that's a whole other topic. Oftentimes, it's very expensive. You still have to pay back all the debts that you're filing bankruptcy for unless they're just a, you know, like a credit card debt. But if, it's, if you want to keep your car in your house, for example, you still have to pay those things back when you file for bankruptcy. It's just that now the court literally forces you. They give you a payment plan. They're the ones checking over your finances. And I don't know about everyone out there, but I'm the last thing I want is the government sticking their hands in my personal financial situation and telling me how to spend my money. Yeah. That a lot of horror stories about that going wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Romans 13, eight. Um, we have Paul saying to owe no one, anything except to love one another. And I think that's, I mean, that's amazing. That's such a, a great picture. You know, if, if we live our lives that way and we don't owe anyone anything, first of all, we have a ton of peace. Second of all, we're not burdening someone else who we've borrowed from, even if it is someone who's a brother or sister in the faith. Um, but the number one thing we need to owe one another is to love someone. And that's huge. I mean, if we look at, if we look at debt today, and we think about how we owe on cars and, and um, houses and student loans and credit cards and all these things. What if you had the same, uh, what if you had the same type of ideas behind loving someone and that's how you treated it, you know, as if it's, it's a literal demand 
that, that you have to work hard to continue to owe someone that, that type of love. That's a, that's a good way to look at love. That's a whole new perspective. Well, Brennan, how does scripture view borrowing as a concept? So what we, what we just kind of discussed in Proverbs, it's really clear. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant to the lender. Um, the English word there, we can say slave or servant. Uh, this is not a positive. So oftentimes when the word servant is used, it's a good thing, right? Um, serve your master with everything that you've got, serve your neighbor, that type of thing. But this is a negative connotation. You are, you are signing yourself up for slavery, for servitude, where there doesn't need to be any. So if, I mean, if that's what you want to do, you go ahead. I'm not going to tell you what to do or what not to do. But I know for me, I don't want to sign a car note and then be a servant to whoever I'm borrowing from and not have any more options because now I have to go to work and, you know, keep a certain job and a certain income just to keep stuff. Um, that seems really silly to me. And I think the negative connotation that's constantly behind this, the scriptures, uh, as far as borrowing, you know, I think it speaks for itself. When we borrow, we put ourselves into voluntary slavery with whoever is lending to us. That's the bottom line. You know, it's funny you mentioned Proverbs. Um, when I was younger, when I was in Bible school, I, I went through, we, we actually had a class on biblical finance as well. And um, interesting. One, one of the interesting things that stuck out to me was the, the idea that I was never presented before, which was simply um, both Exodus and in the New Testament, this idea that um, it is allotted for six days that you should work and then rest on the seventh. Yeah. Whereas in our culture, you know, we have this idea of like, I uh, work five days, I take two days off. Maybe I get off a little early on Friday and take two and a half days off. Right. And it's like uh, kind of like a game we play every week with our culture. And it just makes me wonder if there's any correlation there. Because if I was in debt, how much more could I help to get out of debt if I work six days a week? Now, don't get me wrong. I know some people are already doing this. I myself have worked two jobs for a long time trying to right. clear up debt, trying to get out of, you know, get into a better place to save, to start a business, to do other things, to do this channel in general. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, a lot of people um, are already trying to do things like that. But just in case that has never crossed your mind, that's also something to keep in mind is that uh, scripture does encourage six days of working. Yes. And I think, you know, this is my personal opinion. I'm not going to tell someone what the law says because I'm not a teacher of the law. But um, in my personal opinion, that's a part of the Sabbath command. Um, it's not just to rest seven days. It's also to work six days because, um, and I made a video about this, a short video about this a while back. We are designed to work even before the fall of man. Mankind is designed to work. We have a creator and he created us in his image. He is a worker. He's a designer, right? So that's who we are by nature as well. And, um, there's a proverb about that too, is if you're, if you're in debt, I think it's proverb six. I can't remember exactly, but it talks about if you're in debt, deliver yourself as, the uh, as the what does it say deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter right so if if you're in debt you need to treat that like a life and death situation to where you're the gazelle in the situation and the cheetah's chasing you down ready to kill you um if you treat it like that you're going to be working really hard to get out of that debt and that's the biblical idea behind it right um that's exactly what it says it says give no sleep no slumber to your eyes that's a big deal and Brendan, you know, before we get too far and too deep into this, um, let's just let the audience know a little bit about what brought you to this type of, of uh, discourse and how you're doing classes on these things. And uh, tell a little bit about your website and who you are. Okay. Yeah. So I lived a, a life um, in my younger days as a kid with a single parent. Um, I had a stepdad come and go, uh, but mainly my mom raised me and my brother. And she worked really hard to do that. She oftentimes worked three jobs at the same time. And it was never that she didn't have enough income. Now, looking back, it was just that she didn't know what to do with that income like we discussed earlier. And so as soon as I got married, realizing that my mom has gone through so much turmoil with finance and also within her marriage because of finance, there's been so much stress, tension, fights, all those things. As soon as I got married, we decided we are not living that life right? We're not going to do that. So we need to do something to get educated. We reached, we researched for education and we found some, and I became very passionate about this whole financial topic. And I've always been a very dedicated individual. 
And it's funny because personal finance, this is, this is going to blow your mind. Not really, but personal finance is personal. It's behavioral, right? The numbers are, it's grade school math, it's addition and subtraction. But the main thing here is behavior. And we can see that all through the scriptures. You have to be disciplined. You have to work hard. You have to deliver yourself. You have to, you know, all these things fit in and it comes from discipline. And so I became extremely passionate about it. And now that's the role that I play within the body and, you know, outside of the body, hoping to show people the truth in the scriptures is showing them that the scriptures give us a great outline about personal finance and how to be disciplined, how to manage all the blessings that you receive, take care of your household, those types of things and then apply them to modern day situations. Um, you can find a, a lot more information from me at my website, which is under one love.org. That's numeric one. There's all kinds of stuff there. There's my Facebook uh, page, my YouTube channel, just, you know, everything that I have going on, all of my services, it's right there. Um, but you know, long story short, I'm very passionate about this topic because of the type of life that I've gone through. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, brother. And if you guys haven't already checked out both his website and his YouTube, make sure to go check that. I'll have the video or excuse me, his links for his website and his YouTube channel in the description of this video below. So at the same time, as this is your first time in Kingdom in Context, smash the like button, subscribe, tap the bell for notifications. Uh, same thing with Brennan's channel. And that's how you show your support. And uh, also leave a comment if you have any questions. And then Brennan and I will try to check this video um, after it's been aired to try to answer those as time allows. Yes. So, okay. And then we can flow into whatever next you want to talk about. Okay. What's the, um, credit cards. Is that what's next? Sure. Yeah. You can say, uh, yeah. What about credit cards? People with credit card debt. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll get into the, the myths and truths that sure. are there. Three, two, one. Brennan, you know, I was told very, uh, when I was like 21 years old, I got my first credit card and I was told that I needed to keep debt on the credit card to build my credit score. Um, I was also told I needed to like pay in a certain systematic way to reduce my interest on the credit card, but yet still keep a certain amount on there so that the credit companies viewed me as an actual, uh, to have credit you know, value and so that I didn't have like a quote unquote debt account. What are some of the myths about credit cards that you want to share with people? Yeah, that's great. Well, some of, some of what you were told is true, right? If you want to maintain a high credit score, then yes, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to keep debt. But as we just saw in the scriptures, and as we'll continue to see throughout, debt is not, the, the way we view it in our culture is not biblical. This is not a helpful tool. This is a scam. This is servitude, right? And if, again, if you want to sign yourself up for that, go ahead, but that's just not who I am. Um, a myth about credit cards you need your credit card to build your credit, right? That's partially true if you want to build your credit, sure. But the truth to this whole thing is you're not going to need credit when you start following uh, biblical principles to handle your finances. Because when you start doing that, you are going to cash flow anything and everything that you have to have, right? Um, the, only, the only concept behind credit is we need to keep borrowing and paying all that we're borrowing back on time, making just the minimum payments, never paying it off so that we can build our credit score. But when you ask the question, why, why build our credit score? It's just to keep borrowing. It's just to keep getting more stuff, right? So then you get, you get pushback questions like, well, what about buying a house? And people don't think about the other ways that there are to buy a house, which we can get into in a little bit, but you don't need a credit score to function in this economy, in this culture. You just don't need it. It's a major lie that has been pressed upon us and marketed to us so heavily. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the heavily, most heavily marketed things that's out there is the entire credit lie, credit cards, car payments, mortgages, student loans, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's a stronghold. So what about, some people may ask, well, if I'm traveling, I'm, I need a credit card for hotel check-ins or possibly even rental cars, what would you say to them? That's a myth. So yeah, the myth is you need a credit card to rent a car, check into a hotel, buy online, fly, things like that. The truth is the debit card is going to do all of these exact same things. But the kicker is you actually have to have some money, right? So we rent cars all the time. We travel, we stay at hotels, we fly, we even go out of the country. Um, all these things can be done with the debit card, but you have to have some money, which is not a bad thing to make a deposit on your hotel room, for example. You make a small deposit, you stay in the room, as long as nothing's damaged in the hotel, you get your deposit back. 
debit card will take care of it the exact same way. You do not need a credit card for that. All right. Brennan, what are a couple of other misconceptions or misunderstandings, possibly myths that we may be viewing all of our life concerning credit cards? So there's a few more common ones. And again, you're not going to get this education uh, hardly anywhere, right? Because the main education that you're getting on credit cards is from the corporate giants who are issuing the credit cards and they're not doing that to help you, right? They're doing that to make money for themselves. Their buildings are bigger than yours. Their furniture is nicer than yours. Obviously, they're in the business to make money. Um, so another myth is that debit cards have more risk than credit cards. This is another myth. Um, the truth is companies like Visa, who issue the credit card and the debit card, give the exact same securities to each of those cards. So that's another marketing myth that credit card companies often use, or maybe bankers, et cetera, whoever's trying to get you a credit card. Another myth is if you pay off your credit card every month, you're winning because you get to use free money from someone else. The truth is you don't win with money when you use credit cards. That's just the basic truth, right? 60% of us who use a credit card don't pay it off on time. I think that number has actually jumped now to like 78% but I would have to double check that. Nonetheless, 60% is ridiculous, right? We're, the statistics are showing we're not paying our credit cards off on time, so that's just a lie we're telling to ourselves and being told by these marketing companies to get the credit card. Um, it doesn't even make sense when you think that you're using someone else's money for free because you still end up paying all the money back when you pay the credit card off, and if you don't pay it off on time, you pay back more money than what you borrowed. So you're actually not getting ahead and you're not winning by using someone else's money. That's just a myth, right? Um, the next myth is you should get your teenager a credit card to help them be responsible with money. This is a terrible myth. The truth is by getting a teenager a credit card, you're teaching them how not to be responsible with money because you're giving them a way to use money that's been handed out to them that they haven't earned. And that is a terrible way to set your child on their feet, right? They're gonna go through life having that concept behind money that they can just borrow and get money without doing anything. And that's not how money works. Again, if we go back to biblical principle, we live in a reaping and sowing world. If we plant corn, we get corn, right? So thinking that it's just, we're, we're in the land of freebies and we can just go down to the bank and get a credit card for $5,000 and use that $5,000 and everything's great, you're signing yourself up for a world of disaster. Um, so I like the metaphor that, on, on the, the agriculture metaphor, because if we actually look at it from a sense of, if I wanted to plant, if I wanted to plant, you know, something wheat, I better make sure that if I'm going to take wheat from my neighbor at no cost so that I can grow my own wheat and then have enough left over to repay him plus interest, if, if obviously we're not abiding by biblical principles. Right. So it's, it's very interesting in the risk that's involved in you planning to, to use what you've taken from someone else at no cost and make more with it. Right. And here's the interesting part that it took me a long time in my life to really think about was if I can take that $5,000 and make more with it, then because he gave it to me, Depends on what it is, obviously, but in most cases, it's like a business loan, right? Mm -hmm. If you're creating a tangible product that will give you a higher profit return than that $5,000, but if you're just doing it to repair your car, well, then is that car repair going to allow you to earn more money than $5,000? Right. That's, that's yeah. the crap and the, the, um, the temptation, if I could put it like that, might, might come to a lot of people because they view some things as necessary emergencies so they'll dip into a credit line to try to get that money but ultimately like you're saying that you know if we find ourselves in that position then unfortunately we've we've just put ourselves in servitude right yeah and and you know that's an that's an interesting thing that you bring up because a lot of people look at debt like that they look at it as a tool but go back to the scriptures and keep it simple right because if we're going to say that the scriptures are perfect instruction for our lives then we need to follow what they say and it says the borrower is the slave or the servant to the lender. It doesn't say unless it's a business loan and you can make more money. It doesn't say unless it's for a house, unless it's for a car, right? It's every time the borrower is the slave to the lender. And we are not created to be servants to others, especially the nations. That's not who we're made to be. We're made to be free, right? So even if we can say, oh yeah, we can take 
we can take a loan and we can make more money of it. We can make a profit from it. That might be true. That might be great. That might work for you. But again, it's not a biblical thing that you're doing there. And also, almost every time someone considers using debt, they don't risk adjust. So a lot of times we're taught, you know, especially in the financial industry, you're taught to risk adjust for certain investments, but you're never taught to risk adjust the same way for certain debts. And people who think about getting a $5,000 business loan so they can, like you said, go and plant wheat and then grow their own and then give it back to whoever, um, they're not risk adjusting to where, what if they don't grow any wheat, right? Because if that happens, well, then you lose your shorts. And that's, who wants to do that? You know, it's just, it's a really dangerous game to play. It's like playing with fire. And the father has given us instruction and wisdom to know that it's not a safe game to play. Just avoid it if you can. And obviously you can. A long time ago, I had a friend of mine. This is when I was in my early 20s. He had went and, uh, to the seminar. Of, is it Robert Kiyosaki? Mm-hmm. And the Rich Dad, Poor Dad you know, yeah. seminar that was going around real popular. And he read the books as well. And I remember afterwards, he was very excited, wanted to get into real estate investment. And he, he made a statement one time that really just, it stuck with me through the years, but not because I thought it was a great statement because I questioned it and didn't have the answer for it for so long because he said, yeah, I can't wait for the day where I'm a million dollars in debt in real estate. Mm. That means I'm going to have multiple properties that I'm managing and renting out to people and making, you know, lots of money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Something didn't quite set right with me. What do you think about something like that? Yeah. So, so when we think about that, right, let's say we take out a million dollars worth of real estate in our name and we don't have a million dollars in the bank. So if the bank calls our notes, we can't pay it back. What happens if another 2008 recession happens and the economy takes a small dive? You're on the hook for all of those notes, yet you can't even get renters in the house. And if you can, they're not paying you very much for rent because the economy has plummeted. So that's the kind of risk adjustment that we're not thinking about. And Robert Kiyosaki's got some great information. Um, The idea, the concept about rather than thinking, I can't afford something, but thinking, how can I afford something? That's great. And I'm not saying not to ever take any risk, but I'm saying to take calculated risk coupled with wisdom, right? So calculated risk would be something like not signing up for servitude, slavery, Um, calculated risk would look something more like investing into a product or, you know, some kind of investment that you might lose some of your own money, but you also might gain back some of your own money, but you're not borrowing to do that. We're never borrowing to invest. We're never borrowing for anything for that matter. And that's how we have to risk adjust. We can't, we can't sign up for deals like this because they sound good to us at the time. And again, there's more scripture even on that. I, I think what's a back issue to maybe what your friend was going through and what so many other people are going through is being greedy for gain, right? Wanting to make a quick dollar. There's scriptures that warn us about that. The one who's hasty to, to get rich does not go unpunished. And I don't know that that's, um, we can dig that up or maybe you can dig that up when you're watching later on your own time. But Um, I don't know if there's more spiritual application to that, that if you're hasty to be rich, you'll be punished by the father. But certainly I can say if you're hasty to be rich and you're making moves to be rich, get rich quick, you will be punished by your actions in that, let's say you get a million dollars of debt worth of real estate and you lose it all, right? That's the kind of punishment that happens. And the scriptures are telling us this, but it's something we don't listen to, especially in this culture. And we've got to start adjusting the way we're thinking about these topics. What about like really popular um, slogans you see from advertising when you're, when you're you know, shopping or you're going to purchase something or just walking through Best Buy and you're enticed by something that might say rent to own or maybe 90 days same as cash? Yeah. Does that apply into this conversation? Um, so you've got all these different kinds of things that bait you into using these products, right? Um, like for the, for the credit card, um, as an example, you've got cash back, you've got airline miles, uh, free use of someone else's money, discounts at the register, all these types of things. But just one example, let's think about what the cash back thing is telling us. Let's say you get 1% cash back. That sounds good on the surface. Oh, if I spend my money, I get 1% of my money back. But what we're not thinking about is, doing the math and realizing you would have to spend a hundred thousand dollars on that credit card just to get a thousand dollars back. That's absurd. And there's so many statistics that show when we're using plastic, especially credit cards versus cash, 
we are likely to spend 12 to 18% more in general because it's so much easier to just swipe the card and move on, right? So when we're using these types of things that people are marketing to us, they're marketing to them to us for a reason. They know that we're going to spend more and it's going to make them more money. Um, the rent to own, 90 days, same as cash. I mean, there's a bunch of statistics about that that we can get into as well. Um, oftentimes these things don't even ever pay off. Like you have, you have rent to own, uh, for example, a federal trade commission is always investi investigating um, this industry because their internal rates are averaged over 1800, their interest rates, excuse me, are averaged over 1800%. So there's, there's sneaky ways that these things are marketed to where you really don't understand how much interest you're being charged on this type of thing, but their rates are generally that ridiculous. Um, people rent things that they can't afford because they look at the weekly cost and they don't do the math thinking, oh, I can afford that, right? But when we do the math, the average washer and dryer would cost you $20 a week for 90 weeks. That's $1,800. If you're spending $1,800 on a washer and dryer, you've got some serious deep rooted issues because I mean, you can find a highly functioning washer and dryer to get the job done and be content with what you have for 200 bucks. I mean, the, if there's several people out there that are doing this rent to own 90 days, same as cash, whatever, they're constantly buying new things, which means they're also constantly getting rid of their old things. And the way they're getting rid of those things is by selling them. And there's nothing wrong with them at all. We've, we've gotten several new model washer and dryers just because someone got new ones and didn't want those old ones because they didn't match the house or the decoration or whatever the case may be. So, you know, things like this are very dangerous and you're getting charged ridiculous amounts when you actually think through the entire process. You know, it's funny. Um, speaking of mortgages, I used to talk with people when I would sit down with them and that was one of the things that I had learned in doing some research about families because I was usually dealing with families looking at financing and, you know, they're curious about how much they need to save for, for college in 10 years, for their children, or perhaps for their own retirement in 20 years. But then they also, you know, I would ask them about their mortgage and, you know, what's going on with their housing situation. And you would find out that many of them had, um, you know, just moved or previously moved or were about to move, you know, and you're like, oh, okay, what's, and then you realize as I did more research that, you know, for first time homeowners, it's like seven years and then people move. Mm -hmm. They usually upgrade. That's why they move is they yeah. get a larger house or a different house and they sell, you know, they get into a different mortgage try to t pull their equity from the first mortgage into the next one. And so therefore, usually there's a loss in value. It just really depends on the neighborhood they're in. Ultimately, it's a risk and a huge one because it's one of the biggest purchases of their life. Yes. But yet because of their, their desire, they just do it. Yeah, so it's that and it's also right not being content and the pressure from our current culture. As soon as someone gets married, the, the pressure is you got to buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. That's what... You know, that's what we're told from every angle. There's so much pressure to buy a house because people look at renting like it's this terrible thing. And long term, yes, you don't want to be a renter forever. But again, we have to risk adjust. Some of the benefits to renting while you're trying to pay off debt and save up money for emergencies and things like that, taking the steps in order to be financially independent and secure. While you're doing that, renting is a great idea because some of the risk we're not thinking about with getting a house is what happens if your heat and air system goes out? you have to come up with five to 10 grand, whatever it's gonna cost. What happens if you have a major plumbing issue? You've gotta come up with the money in all these different circumstances, whereas if you're a renter, you call the landlord. Hey, we got an issue with the AC. He comes over and fixes it. Your rent stays the same. You still stay on track with all your goals. When we go out and we get a house, especially when we have debt, especially when we don't have money saved for major emergencies, something like three to eight months worth of our living expenses, it's a disaster, man. It's not a blessing at all. I mean, I've seen, I've seen countless issues with just having a mortgage when you have a boatload of other debts that you're trying to pay off and you don't have any money saved. And that's, it's a very common situation in this country and it's, it's really awful. Yeah. In fact, um, I agree with you. I actually used to hear that saving about six months worth of your living expenses was ideal just yes. in the job change or one of the bread earners in the house actually gets injured and can't work for a while. Um, or if you just move, you need to move for whatever reason, if there's something right. going on like natural disaster or calamity or whatever, six months usually can carry you through without going into a lot of debt. 
And yes. that's, you know, but then of course, a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck, they, they really struggle to figure out, well, how do I get to that point of even having those savings? Right. What would you say? Yeah. So there's, there's a system that we follow, right? It's the same system as Dave Ramsey and some of the other people before him. Um, we have to do things in steps because when we try to do multiple things at once, we're not good at doing any of them, right? So the first step is you're going to save a thousand dollars as quickly as you can. And that's going to be for covering basic emergencies. And then step number two is you're going to be paying off your debts from smallest to largest, regardless of interest rate, which the math nerds that freaks them out, but there's a reason behind it. You're going to pay off your debts from smallest to largest for the next two years, however long, to, however long it takes you. And on average, it takes people anywhere from one to three years. So we're not, you know, we're not in debt for a long time. When we really get with it, we start budgeting well um, and we start paying off our debt like with a vengeance, kind of like what Proverbs 6 talks about, delivering yourself like your life is on the line. Um, once we've paid off all of our debt within that one to three years, however, whatever average you fall into, then you can start to save that three to six months or what I say, three to eight months. Um, the only reason I, I used to say three to six months, I changed it to eight because I've dealt with a lot of um, single moms, for example, or, you know, just people who have a low income or maybe they're disabled, etc. I find that if they have eight months worth of savings, I mean, that's a whole two extra months worth of their living expenses, which in a lot of cases, let's say your living expenses are 3000 a month. So in a lot of cases, that's an extra 6000 on top of the six month mark, right? Um, so I find that that can be a lot more helpful with someone in that circumstance. So the three to eight month margin is up to the individual or the family. You discuss that amongst yourselves and find out what you want to do. Um, but those steps are the steps that you're going to follow to get there. And I mean, it's amazing what people can do. Just my wife and I, for example, we, we paid off $85,000 of her student loan debt in three years. And that's with an average income. And people can do this all over the world, all over the country, but you've got to get super serious. You've got to start planning with your money and you've got to stop the borrowing, right? And the crazy thing is once you've paid off your debt within this one to three year mark, whatever, um, you've got so much extra disposable money in your household because you no longer have payments, right? The average people that I work with, their payments range from 500 to $1,500 a month. Well, if you don't have $1,500 a month worth of payments, that means you have $1,500 a month in your pocket. You can really start to make some headway with those kinds of numbers. That's, that's the, the way that we turn this whole thing around. Now, when you talk about payments, or when we're talking about paying down debts, is a car loan included in some of those ideas? Yes, it is. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of myths and truths about car loans as well. Um, but car loans are generally the second biggest purchase behind a house. And um, the average car payment right now is over $500. I mean, that's, that's cuckoo. That's insane, right? We, there, there's this misconception about driving used cars, again, without calculating any risk, without doing hardly any research, thinking we have to go out and get a new car and get a ridiculous uh, payment. And even if we get a lower payment and we get 0% and all these things, again, there's more myths and truths that we can go over. But spending that kind of money on a car, when you can get a vehicle that does the exact same thing, takes you all around, um, maybe you need a minivan, you can get a used minivan for a lot less of a cost without a payment, and you can work your way up into nicer, newer minivans over time, but it takes some discipline and it takes being content. And then we get back to, again, this whole thing about personal finance is personal. It's behavioral, right? We have to dig into our inner self and realize I'm the problem. I need to change me. I need to be content. I need to stop having this, I want it and I want it now attitude, right? And again, all of these things are scriptural. So the first myth we can go into is that car payments are a way of life, right? You're always gonna have a car payment. In order to have nice new cars, you're gonna have to have a car payment. The truth is driving paid for, used, reliable cars is what the average millionaire does. Um, I'll ask you the question, uh, put you on the hot seat for a second. What is a millionaire? What is a millionaire? Yeah. What, what, what constitutes a millionaire? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what parameter you're asking. By. Like what, what, uh, what's the requirement to consider yourself a millionaire? What would you say has to be part of your financial uh, scope? Are you talking about savings in the bank? 
or sure. property allocation, liquid assets? Like, what are we yeah. doing down there? I mean, you you've had you have a financial background, so you would you know you might know the answer, but most people don't know the answer to that question. They think that a millionaire is someone who makes a million dollars or more per year. Oh yeah, but of course they're not thinking of taxes and expenses and all their <laughs> right. They're not thinking about that, but even still. Being a millionaire really has nothing to do with your income. Right. Um, someone who is a millionaire is someone who has a net worth of a million dollars or more. Yeah. And, you know, that's a piece of education that I never had, but that's life changing. Because once we start figuring out how to calculate our net worth, which is you just take everything that you owe minus what you own, right? So if you have a mortgage, if you have a car payment, et cetera, you list out those numbers, your debts and you subtract them from what you own, the things that you actually do own, like your car. Maybe you own one of the cars. Maybe you own some uh, investments or something like that. Most people in the country have a negative net worth. They, they owe more than what they actually own to where if they liquidated everything that's theirs, they still couldn't get out of debt. But a millionaire is someone who has a net worth of a million dollars or more. So, I mean, that's all that is. But that's what the average millionaire does is they drive used, reliable, paid-for cars. If we, if we want to get to a point of financial stability, they're a pretty good example to follow. So at $500 a month car payment times 12 months, we're looking at six grand a year times average three to four year car payment, right? right. So now we're looking at a possible $24,000, $24, right? Over four years that you could save? That's right. That's yeah. right. You could save that $24,000. And if you... You know, if you make some short-term sacrifice and you get a, I'm not telling you to drive a car that's going to leave you stranded or, you know, your wife is going to take the kids to school and wreck or something like that. I'm telling you to drive a used car that's still safe and reliable. And believe it or not, they're still out there. I mean, there's models as old as the 2000s that are in great shape, are dependable cars, get good gas mileage, you know, the whole, the whole bit. Um, but if we make those short-term sacrifices, then instead of paying $500 a month and car payments, we can start to instead use that $500 a month to pay ourselves. And then as we're saving up that money, our car is not losing value because it's an old car. It's already lost all of its value. So we can likely, within a year or two, sell it at the same price that we bought it for, all the while saving up $500 a month. And then guess what? We move up in car by another $6,000 or whatever it is. But it takes, again, discipline, contentment, short-term sacrifice, all these types of things. A lot of folks watching may actually be in a car payment right now that they are uh, upside down in. you have any advice for them? Yes. Um, the, the general rule of thumb that I give is if you can't pay off your vehicle within two years or less on the plan that we provide, then you need to get rid of the car. And to some people, this is a major shock. Like, oh my gosh, I have to get rid of my car. Well, if your foot is diseased and it's killing you, you amputate your foot. It's the same thing with the, with the Tahoe, right? You've got to amputate the Tahoe because it's killing you. And the way you get out of an upside down vehicle is you're going to have to come up with the difference in money and you're going to have to sell the vehicle privately at the best rate that you can get. And then you're going to have to pay the bank the difference so that you can pay off the loan and give the new buyer um, the title. And then you've also got to come up with two to $3,000 to get yourself one of these used cars that we're talking about just to start out and make some short-term sacrifice. Um, there's a lot more details on how to get this done, but that's the way you can do it. It's not impossible to get out of an upside down vehicle. And oftentimes it can dramatically change your financial situation because again, you eliminate one of those huge payments and all that money starts coming back into your pocket so that you can start paying off other debts that are killing you. And you just create this great rolling snowball effect. Well, Brendan, what about people that are buying a house? Yeah, so we, we touched on this earlier and I said I would get back to it. Um, the myth is you need a mortgage to buy a house and to get a mortgage, you need credit. Um, the truth is doing the 100% down plan is not as hard as it seems. That's my first suggestion. Obviously, because I'm trying to stay as biblical as possible, I believe you know, we should not be borrowing from the nations because of the type of slavery that it puts you into. Um, the 100% down plan is exactly what my wife and I are, are doing. And we're on goal. We're on track to meet that goal within a few short years. It's not as hard as it seems. Um, I do tell people if you must have a mortgage, though, you can get a mortgage without a credit score. So we can figure out how to do that. So the way we get a mortgage without a credit score is 
we have to do what's called manual underwriting. Okay. Um, un unlike other debts, we don't put this into our snowball when we're trying to pay it off. But when we talk about just getting a mortgage, there's a way to do it without a credit score. The way we do it is we find a mortgage company who does that. They're a little bit harder to find than traditional mortgage companies, but what they do is they look into the details of your life and they figure out, have you paid your landlord on time? Um, do you pay your utilities on time? Have you held a job for a significant amount of time? Do you have a decent down payment? Things like that. That's what they look at. And then they write you a mortgage based on those details. Today, the regular mortgage lenders, they do it the lazy way and all they look at is your FICO score. But if you're going to go with traditional manual underwriting, then what you're going to have to do is get an indeterminable credit score. That means you have a zero for a credit score. And the way that you do that is you pay off all your debts, you cancel every account that's open in your name as far as a debt account, and then within six months to a year, you're going to have a zero credit score. And that's what's going to make you indeterminable as far as a FICO score. And then you can go and get a mortgage that way as well. Interesting. Okay. Brennan, a lot of folks watching right now, they're probably excited to get some good information because this is, this is quality information. Um, and I think that many people though, may be asking themselves, well, I've got a lot of debt, but how do I actually get out of all this debt? What's the process? Sure. So we touched on it earlier, Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Um, this is the solution right here. So really soak this in. My son, if you become surety for your friend, Bible talk for if you take on debt. If you have shaken hands and pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself. For you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumbering to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. On top of that, you have to get sick and tired of struggling and being broke, right? That's, that's what it takes in almost every situation. If you're going to make a change in any area of your life, you've got to get sick and tired of what's currently happening. And the only way you're going to change is when you do that, right? Romans 12, be renewed, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you have to renew your mind the way you're thinking about things, the way you're thinking about debt, the way you're thinking about your financial situation. It takes that initially, digging deep, having that conversation with yourself and making those types of decisions and then committing to them, right? What comes after that is things like strict budgeting. And then the debt snowball that we were talking about earlier, where you list all your debts from smallest to largest, you make all of the minimum payments on your debts, and then you attack the little one, again, like your life depends on it. And I told you there was a reason behind that for, the, for all the math nerds. And this has actually been proven in a study by, I believe, Harvard. Um, you can look that up as well on your own time, whoever's watching. It shows that paying off your debts from smallest to largest is actually a more effective way to pay off all of your debt and become debt free than paying off the largest interest rate first. The reason why is because we go back to the same thing again. This is a psychological behavioral thing that we're talking about. It's personal. So when we make some small little wins and we're starting out, we pay off a $2,000 credit card. We get a little bit of courage. We pay off then a $5,000 credit card. We've got a lot more courage. Then we attack a $10,000 car payment. We really start to believe and know that we can do this. And then we can go after bigger things like the student loans or whatever it is. It's a bigger debt in your life. But following that system is how you're going to effectively do this. Because if you attack the biggest interest rate first, but it's also the biggest debt, and you start trying to pay that off with intensity, you're likely going to burn out. It's, you can equate it to trying to lose weight. If you use a method to lose weight and it takes you four months to lose a pound, you're probably going to give up. But if you pick a different method and you can lose a pound in the first week or two, you're going to have a little bit of courage and it's going to carry on some momentum throughout that. Yeah, Brennan, I, th this is a huge issue for a lot of people as far as just, like you said, you, you have to build courage. But that is really the best way I've ever heard of looking at it is that just like with all of our behaviors, we have to build them over time. Um, just like any muscle, your behaviors are like muscles. 
they're stronger the more you do them and it's you know you're more steadfast the more you do them um, and if obviously inversely the less you do them the weaker you are so many times people don't do not equate good saving and proper you know budget um, pr properly handling their budget with actual discipline until it's really presented to them as what that what that really takes in their life and sometimes it even takes a little bit of sacrifice in the very beginning would you agree I do I do agree it takes a lot of short-term sacrifice so like I was saying earlier on average we have people paying off all of their debts beside their mortgage which this could be a number up to I mean in our case it was eighty five thousand dollars right um, we have people paying off all their debts within one to three years on average, depending on how intense they are. And that's, that takes a lot of short-term sacrifice. But what comes from that is long-term gain. And that's what we're really after. That's the kind of gain that is biblical, right? We work hard, we stay diligent. And as we can see in Proverbs, the diligent prosper. It's a, success is a byproduct of consistent, diligent behavior. And so some of the things that we're going to have to sacrifice um, – are things like our lifestyle habits, right? The, the things that we do within our lifestyle, the conveniences and comforts that we have, um, our desires, things like going and getting a new car just because the alternator went out or something like that on the old car. Um, a lot of fun that we count on having, taking annual vacations or maybe even biannual vacations. Um, and then sacrificing things like extras, all the extras that come in. And it's funny because when I sit down and walk people through a budget and work with them on their own personal budget and they revisit that monthly, they start to realize that they, they previously were overspending somewhere around 500 to a thousand dollars on all kinds of extras. We're talking about going out to eat entertainment, you know, just you, you name it being uh, not focused at the grocery store and just buying whatever is appealing to the eye and things like that. So those are the types of sacrifices that you're going to have to make. You have to learn how to say no. You have to learn how to say no to all different areas of life. No to yourself when you want something that you see at the grocery store like that, you know, that chocolate snack or that ice cream or whatever. Tell yourself no. Practice some delayed gratification and contentment, and it's going to result in long-term gain. Yeah, I totally agree with you. In fact, I, I love how you've you've woven in the Proverbs to a lot of what you've been saying tonight, because ultimately, um, I'm trying to remember if it's Proverbs 28 or but it talks about that a faithful man will abound with blessings, but those who are hasty to get rich, they're, they're going to be punished for that. That's behavior. exactly it. You know, and I think that um, that's just this, what you're talking about, this consistency, this desire, like you, like you've uh, use the metaphor from Proverbs 6 earlier of a gazelle escaping the, the grasp of a lion or, you know, so it won't be prey right. and running from this mentality of being in debt and being okay with that and, um, and taking some practical small steps in the beginning. Like you said, even if it's just being disciplined at the grocery store, right. if that's what it takes to start like in the first moment, you know, um, just instead of buying the chips, maybe you don't, right. you know, maybe you just, uh, eat some raisins, uh, a little bit or who knows. I mean, yes. just being silly. Actually, I remember several years ago, um, I was, uh, just different time in my life and I'd, I'd put on some weight and I was like, oh man, this is, this is, this snuck up on me. Right. Yeah. And so I went to, I changed my eating, you know, immediately and, uh, stopped eating before bed for five or six hours. But, I would just drink water and then, you know, just uh, eat these little yogurt covered raisins basically to sure. pacify my sweet tooth. But at the same time, um, in one month I dropped 25 pounds. Now I was going to the gym three times a week as well, but I dropped 25 pounds in a month. So it was just like, you know, it was sm something small, you know, I didn't do some, uh, keto, keto diet. I didn't, I didn't go on any kind of Atkins diet. It wasn't like, honestly, I still ate like, high sodium Chinese food every now and then, you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't a whole bunch of big changes, but I had big results. And I think that, um, what you've been saying tonight, I hope people can carry that with them as well, that this doesn't have to be daunting, that you can make smaller changes yeah. and you'll start to see amazing strides to where hopefully you get the courage to address bigger changes as well. Right. And that's what it leads into. So you start to make those small type of sacrifices and then you can graduate to the bigger ones like what we discussed earlier, right? Getting rid of the car that's drowning you. Right. Um, that's a big sacrifice and that's a big decision that you have to make. But when you do that, again, short-term sacrifice for long-term gain, that has to be the visual. That has to be what we see. We can't just be looking down right in front of us. We have to think toward the future. 
And if we're ever going to get financially stable, these are the types of things that we have to do. And it's funny that you mention um, the losing weight side of it because what often happens is when you start being a little more strict on your grocery uh, bill and you look at your, your budget and see how much you're spending in food and also eating out, oftentimes people get healthier as well because what happens? You have to start cooking more home-based meals, yeah. right? So um, there's a little added benefit that you can throw in there. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it really, I mean, it's a, it's a very simple concept, but it's not easy to do because if it was easy, we would all be, I mean, there would be no need for this, for this discussion, right? Yeah. Well, it, it's not easy initially. I would challenge that for most people out there listening, it's simply uh, our culture has designed us to think it's not easy initially. Right. And then like if you're taking some of the advice that, that Brennan's offering tonight, you're going to start to change your mind and your thoughts as you go through this process and realize, wait a minute, oh, I see, I see where those advertisements have caused me to think this way, yes. or I see where culturally something I watched my parents do growing up has caused me to think this way. And you start to make some changes, you'll start to break out of that paradigm, find this biblical paradigm, and before you know it, you know, you're walking in wisdom. And that's why I love Proverbs. You know, back when I was in Bible college, I actually, um, like I said, we, we had to take this financial class in Bible yeah. college. And I went home one day just interested because I saw Proverbs being quoted often in this Bible financial class. And so I went through the whole book of Proverbs, there's 31 chapters, and I counted every single verse that had to do with money. There's 103 different verses that have to do with money in the book of Proverbs. It's only 31 chapters. So that's yeah. on average three references per chapter in a book that's considered the book of wisdom. So I think the father wants to give us some good advice on it. It is incredible, man. Um, Dave Ramsey says it best. He says, if you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll have a degree in personal finance. <laughs> nice. I mean, that's exactly it. There's, there is so much bountiful information on personal finance that we can apply to our modern situation today um, within Proverbs. And then also within the rest of the scriptures. I mean, there's, there's over like 2000 scriptures that have to do with work and finance. And when we look at those and we think of how we can apply them to ourselves, I mean, the father wants us to be blessed, right? It's not, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, with having some form of blessings. All, many of the patriarchs were wealthy, mm -hmm. but there's a process to get there. There's a heart change that has to happen. There's content that has to come with it. There's wisdom. There's, there's all these different dynamics that the scriptures are very clear on, on how to get there and who to become when you do get there. And frankly, I mean, you're not going to be blessed by the father until you can prove to him that you can manage the little bit of blessings that he's already giving you, right? It, yeah. We can go back to the Messiah saying, um, he who's faithful with little will be trusted with more. He's talking about much, deep, much more detailed uh, circumstances, but we can apply that to finance by saying, if we're faithful with the little bit of blessing that he gives to us, he's going to trust us to manage more. Because again, at the end of the day, we're just managers. That's the bottom line of this whole thing. We are managers of the Father's resources. Yeah, I mean, obviously the famous parable of the talents, Matthew 25. Yes. Matthew Messiah talking about, you know, people that had money and what they did with it and which ones were praised. You know, if the viewer hasn't went to Matthew 25 and read that parable, very insightful, right? Yes. So even the Messiah is walking around trying to teach the people listening to him about money and how God wants you to handle it in a responsible way. Um, and it's like you, like we were talking about, Brennan, it's not just so we can drive nicer cars or have a bigger house or maybe have a, you know, an Apple watch or whatever, right. but simply it's hard for me to be a blessing to my neighbor if I don't have anything. Bingo. Uh, and that's, that's the, the issue is like, I'll never be a lender to my brother in Christ if I don't even have it to lend. So and right. he's not asking me because he does, doesn't want to get a job. He's probably in need. You know exactly. what I mean? So like, this is a principle that was, that was insulated inside God's Torah, his instructions for living, where the priests and the tabernacle and the temple, they were to receive the tithes and any overflow would go towards the overall bank or resource of the temple that they then parceled out to the widows, the orphans, the poor, those right. in need that had, you know, trying to get on their feet for, you know, a reason. Obviously, all these other rules about work and evaluations of how they're poor and what became of them, what's going on, what are the circumstances. Obviously, if you're a widow or an orphan, it may have been more difficult for you to acquire income than for right. just a regular man who's poor, right? So the, obviously there's judgment involved, but ultimately the, the whole system was set up so that there can be abundance and then those who are in need could have it lent out to them or given yes. to them 
to help them. And so this, this whole, like Brennan's talking about, this whole process will actually change your, your mindset over time so that once you get to a place of having savings, you're no longer thinking, oh man, I'm just going to go right out and buy a new boat. Right. Because you're thinking yeah. now, wait a minute, what's a really fun way that I can help those around me or that I can better serve the father now that I do have some resources at my disposal and I know how to gain those resources again and again every year for the rest of my life. That's exactly it. And man, I, you know, that's, that's the entire view of this whole thing. We're not, I don't do what I do to help you become extremely wealthy. That's not my goal for you. Um, my goal for you is to be exactly who the father has created you to be. He's created you to be free. He's created you to take care of your own household. He's created you to give generously to the widow, the poor, um, the, the orphan, etc. cetera. Um, he's created you to do all these different things. But again, there's a way to get there. And we, we realize like what you just said, when we don't have, when, when we have payments coming out of our ears and we can't use any of the income that we're making for anything except to keep paying for the stuff that we call ours, which is really the bank stuff, when, when that's our circumstance, we can't help, right? And like Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Well, if you're a good man and you want to fulfill that scripture there and you want to leave an inheritance, you can't do that when you have constant payments and you can never put any money aside, right? That's where investing comes in. That's where figuring out what modern things we can do to leave an inheritance to our children. Can we buy land, cash paid real estate? You know, can we invest in risk adjusted safe investments safe i say that in quotes just because you know the government's involvement and things like that but um all these types of things are very necessary elements to the bible believer but if we don't follow the principles found in, in the bible itself we can never fulfill these duties that are given to us as god's creation which is like you said giving leaving an inheritance um taking care of our own household it just doesn't happen otherwise yeah absolutely all right. So what other slides would you like to cover? We can do the, uh, let's see. I think ab accidentally we kind of went over the life after debt slide just now. Didn't yeah. We? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I read through your slides a few times, but I didn't have them memorized. So that's all good. That just um, shows how well that it's put together. Right. Cause we just flowed into it with conversation anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so we can, um, I'll just, I guess I can just leave them with a few. Yeah, we're sitting at about an hour and 10 minutes right now, so. Okay, well then let's just wrap it up. Let's. Uh, you want to do like a closing? Yeah, get, um, throw something in there, you know, just some feedback on the information and how the body can use it. And then we'll say our parting, parting words or whatever. I'll give them one last thing to think about, like, you know, ask yourself this question or something like that. Okay, sounds good. All right, so All right, three, two, one. So ultimately, we hope to have provided you know quite a few things to think about. Um, this is a topic that literally touches everyone because it's we all have to deal with money. We all have to you know be smart with it. It can either bless us or it can entrap us. Yeah. And I think that if we just search the scriptures on what it suggests for us, then it can definitely kickstart us into a, a different path that can put us into a place of freedom. And I know there's a lot of people watching right now that may be struggling in different areas with finances. So, you know, just just uh, please reach out to Brennan if you have any questions. Uh, like I said, his, his website is down below and uh, shoot him an email. Um, or, or you can also make your comments down below this video, but ultimately um, just be encouraged because if the, the father gave us all these words in the scriptures about how to handle finances, which means no matter where you are, you can start applying these and a positive outcome will start to take effect. So your situation is not hopeless. Absolutely not. And Brennan, do you, do you have anything uh, you'd like to say in conclusion tonight? Yes, that's, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, this is a very big deal, you know, and, and so many people, they just kind of sweep it under the rug. They use the little bit of education they may have gotten from parents or from these corporate giants and 
they end up making a life full of chaos with that and leaving nothing to their children in the end, dying with debts in their name, you know, not even having a will, for example. I mean, there's just the list goes on and on and on and on of things that we need to do, but that we don't do. And so I would ask the viewer to ask yourself this question. Um, if, if you're a believer, then you believe that all of the resources, all the blessings that come to you ultimately belong to the Father and you're a manager. So ask yourself this question. Am I managing the blessings that God is giving me the way his instructions say that I should? And I think when you ask that question, you're going to be convicted because in most cases you're not. And that's something that we really have to start taking seriously. Uh, you know, we're, we're stewards and we have to take that responsibility very seriously. Um, just like you said, you know, people can reach me with any kind of questions that they have or whatever. This is my day job. This is my full-time thing. So I don't work for free. Um, I do not charge obviously to teach you the scriptures and what they say about money or anything like that. But where I come into the mix is helping you weave your way in and out of these situations that we've covered that we're dealing with in our modern culture today, things like getting out of debt and, you know, my advice as far as what you should do in, in investing and insurances and, all those types of things. I don't sell any products. I tell you what I would do and what I do do. Um, and that's, you know, that's how I fit into this whole equation. You know, Brendan, when I was doing the investment planning years ago, I, I, I went to a school and I was speaking with the teacher um, and she actually brought her husband to the school, which happened often. They wanted to see some of the things that I was putting together for them. Right. And, you know, after I, I kind of made my presentation because I was helping them understand both retirements, both their state funded retirement, as well as their potential personal retirement, should they choose to invest in it. And, but ultimately whether they had personal retirement savings or not, they, most of them had some sort of state retirement. And so I'm explaining these things. And many times, um, statistically, most teachers are women. And so, you know, their husbands would show up and this sweet couple looked at me and, you know, when it was over and I gave them my advice on, on as far as the actual investments to build their personal retirement, which was going to be much, much greater than what the state would offer them. Right. And they just looked at me and smiled and they said, you know, um, we're, we're really not going to be doing any kind of retirement. We truly, we, we believe Jesus is coming back in seven years. Mm. And I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, that's fine. You know, I, but that was 14 years ago. Yeah. Well, right. you know, go back to the parable of the talents. Right. Um, I mean, we, we are given a responsibility. We're given blessings by the Father, and He's expecting us to properly manage those in our current circumstance, regardless of what it is. And the truth is, there's things, there's things that we need to be doing in our current circumstances, in our culture, that we just don't know about or that we just don't do or care to do. And yeah. that's where I would argue that you're, being, you know, you're not being the best steward that you could be. Yeah, these instructions that we're talking about, I mean, they're regardless of whether Yeshua is coming back tomorrow. Yes. He, he didn't put a time qualifier on these instructions and say, only do these if, if you're going to live your full life. That's you know? right. Like it, it <laughs> yeah, you fact, take care of you. You know, uh, Brennan, you, you probably are aware we do another show here on Honor of King, or excuse me, here on Kingdom of Context, we do a, another show called Honor of Kings. Mm -hmm. And we just finished reviewing the book of Tobit. And that's one of the books that used to be in the Bible was taken out um, right. about 140 years ago. But What's interesting is that in the storyline of the book of Tobit, this guy named Tobit had, he was part of the tribe of Naphtali that was invaded by the Assyrians. He went into captivity into Assyria and part of the storyline, he sends his son to go retrieve some money, a large sum of money from some other people that he had already sent ahead of the invasion. Mm. So he knew they were going to be invaded. He could see the, the warning signs. Um, and, and the Assyrian Kings invaded over um, a span of 25 years, but, the tribe of Naphtali was one of the first tribes to be invaded and taken into exile and scattered. So he kind of saw the warning signs. He sent money with an extended relative who was already over in that area of land in that other kingdom that was about to take over Naphtali, the tribe of Naphtali. And so therefore, once they got into captivity, he now had this large sum of money already waiting on him. Yeah. So it's yeah. just little things of wisdom uh, yeah. that can be done. And this, this helped them because this guy was blind the, the, the reason he sent his son to go get the money was because the, the main uh, protagonist of the story, Tobit, he became blind. So now he couldn't work and his wife was having to go work odd jobs to try to help them with finances. And so he was like, wait, I've got an investment waiting on me that I sent over here before, you know, which is pretty fascinating to me, yeah. like to have that kind of foresight. But it's prudence, right? And yeah, turned shocker. Out in shocker, right? The diligent prosper. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, this is not, it's, 
again, it's very simple. This is not rocket science. It, you do your job. I get so many questions, man, about the economy and what, what if we come into another recession and what, how does what Trump's doing affect me and what about taxes and all this stuff? And my answer is always the same. You take care of your household and your personal finance, regardless the currency system, regardless the economy. You handle your things the way that the Bible instructs you to do so. And when something like a 2008 recession happens, you're not going to be one of the ones that suffers. The ones who suffered in 2008 were the ones who bit off way more than they could chew and had in, um, immense amounts of debt. Yeah. It's that simple. Take care of you. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Brennan, it's been awesome. Appreciate okay. you joining me tonight, man. And uh, guys, go check out his uh, website. And um, also, um, it's, it's going to be in the link below the video here. And we appreciate you. Is there any final, any final words, Brennan? I think we've done a great job, man. I think the, uh, the viewer has a lot to, to digest. And if they've got questions, they can come to me. Um, I thank you again for having me on. It's been great. I love this channel. And I'm just here to serve the people with, with this particular uh, thing here, personal finance. Awesome, brother. Thanks for joining me. And thanks, guys, for joining uh, us here tonight on Kingdom in Context. And uh, make sure you've already subscribed, tap the bell, and uh, send, us a, send us a note down below. And let us know what you thought of this video. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Kingdom in Context. The Creator never intended for us to be confused by His words. He gave us His words of life, and He gave them in context to be understood and beneficial to our walk with Him. This channel's goal is to bring clarity to some of the misconceptions that have formed over time among believers and taught by others, however innocent and well intended. The scriptures make complete sense when we keep them in context of His coming kingdom and His coming King, Jesus the Messiah. If you're blessed by what we're doing with this channel and feel led to support us, visit the video description below where we have a PayPal option, a monthly Patreon option, or a traditional P.O. Box address. Thank you, and remember, context creates comprehension.